literally normal soap is all that you need in order for that uh, virus to dissolve and for it to be effective hand washing. Excited. Uh, just, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Excited then for our first ever um, live podcast uh, that was recorded last week. Uh, just wish it was under different circumstances. Hey, Tim. Um, but it's, it was our pleasure to welcome Dr. Sally Bell back onto the podcast. Sally reached out to us at the end of last week saying, with everything that's going on with the, with the coronavirus, um, would you be up for um, doing a special uh, podcast edition and uh, we were like yes that is a great idea yeah it was an awkward one th when we first started to come around to the idea because normally jack and i do the podcast standing about half a meter away from each other and sometimes we hold hands which both of those <laughs> things are outlawed at the moment so we had to do it remotely we've got sally on a video call as well so um, we've managed to get get it get together and have a really good conversation and it's just the, the essence of this is around controlling the controllables in uncertain times there's a ton in it. We're not going to try and do a recap in here, but I think, yes, we are in times where we need a little bit of special advice, but you know, the reality is that there's some really good stuff in here for just general health and well-being, as usual, that we get from the great mind of Sally Bell. Yeah, so there'll be, there's lots of practical things, as Tim said, that you're going to be able to, to take away and do. And also, we really want to encourage you that, to share this with um, anyone, any friends, any family, loved ones that you, um, that you know this, that those, those, key sort of messages and takeaways and things that people can do practically to help um, in, in boost or talk about boosting immunity, but just building up our sort of health, wellness and resilience during this difficult um, period. Um, and then just the final thing to say is we know that a lot of you are um, going to be at home and there have been a lot of questions from people asking about training at home. And so we've decided, we've made a decision this week to um, our body weight basics bundle, which includes uh, principles of movement, strength and play which was a 40 pound bundle, those two together, we've made it completely free um, to try and help people enjoy and get the most out of their bodyweight training whilst at home. So bodyweight basics bundle um, is absolutely free right now um, are inside the virtual classroom. The link will be in the show notes for that. But you can always go to schoolcastx.com and you will see all the details for the virtual classroom and the free or now free bodyweight basics program inside there. So sit back and enjoy Sally Bell for the third time on the School of Calisthenics podcast. This was recorded live as a webinar as well. So we've got live questions from some of the audience members. So there's a load of stuff. Enjoy it. And we'll see you again very soon. <laughs> so, yeah, great to be here. Looking <laughs> forward to chatting today. Yeah, and this is the first, um, the first time we've done a, well, it's sort of a webinar, but it's effectively going to be... Um, the podcast so there's a number of people that are in here with us live and they're going to be able to ask some questions as we go through which is going to be uh, great to get that um, individual sort of interaction as you say with some friendly faces um, and, and names that you recognize from most often Instagram these days but um, they'll this is also some people will be watching this on the replay which will be hopefully on YouTube or on the podcast and if if you do feel that this, some of the information here is going to be helpful for friends, family, and other loved ones, then please do share this um, so that we can get to um, get the, the vital information out to people that, um, that are going to need it most. So we appreciate your uh, support in doing that. I think there was quite a number of people saying like, oh, thank you for putting this, this on. Um, so massive thank you for Sally for coming on to the podcast. It was her idea. We've had her onto the podcast twice before, uh, but with what's everything that's going on with Corona, uh, she reached out at the beginning of the week or the end of last week and said, "Can we? Let, why don't we do um, an ad hoc, um, straight off the bat um, episode for specifically for this? Um, and so we've titled it Boosting Immunity because we want to get into the um, phrase that Tim just mentioned before, controlling the controllable. So rather than uh, going through our opinions on, on coronavirus and what's happening and, and what what we think we should or shouldn't do. We want to get an expert's advice. So Dr. Sally Bell, functional medicine practitioner as well, um, your advice um, on the things that we can actually do to help uh, protect ourselves and keep ourselves as healthy as possible and boost our immunity, um, essentially. Um, does that sound good? Yeah, sounds, sounds good. Sounds great. 
It feels like a bit of an interesting one. I, I tried to put some, some content out on Instagram yesterday, Sally, and I almost didn't know where to start with talking about this. I feel like I've seen so much, heard so much. I've probably, my, my mind is running over a number of different things. Um, and it's kind of been on a bit of a journey myself. Do you want to just kind of give us a short kind of to the point, factual mm-hmm. overview of where we are at? Like what is the, the current sort of situation from, from your perspective? Um, and then that might sort of form a bit of a, a, a jump, a springboard for it to dive into some more specific points about what we can do as, as Jack says, to control what we are um, enabled to control. Yeah. So uh, we're dealing with a pandemic of the coronavirus and it's actually called COVID-19. Um, The reason for that is that we have a number of coronaviruses in the world um, that we have studied over the years. Some affect animals, some affect humans. Um, There are seven coronaviruses that affect humans and uh, some of them will give the common cold right through to more serious conditions like MERS. Um, So this is a new virus that none of us have been exposed to and currently there are no treatments and no vaccines. Uh, Therefore, the majority of the population around the world will be exposed to this and the only thing uh, that we have to fight it is our own immune system. Um, There's a massive tactic um, to delay um, the transmission of this disease because a small percentage are getting uh, very sick. The figures around how many are getting sick vary um, because in some countries they're not swabbing everyone. Uh, So if they're just swabbing those that are coming into hospital, their mortality rates can look very high. But if we look at um, the cruise liner that got isolated, they swabbed that all of the uh, uh, clients that were on board um, and they came up with a mortality rate of about um, 0.87% which to put that into context is what we see in a severe flu epidemic. Um, So that means that actually 99.3% are going to be exposed to this virus and survive. I think we need to say that some people are going to have no symptoms at all and their immune uh, immunity will fight it off. Some people will have mild symptoms like um, a cough and a cold. And then there's those that are going to have to be hospitalized. And some of those that are hospitalized are going to have to have support with ventilation because this virus particularly affects the lungs. Um, And the reason that we are so passionately getting the message out there about trying to reduce transmission um, isn't to stop people getting it all together. It's to delay how many people are going to require that extra intensive care Um, Because we only have so many beds as a nation um, that can offer that. If everybody gets it together, we are not going to be able to offer that support. And then people who could have had good care and survived it will die unnecessarily. But that's why it's this whole thing about flattening the curve. If we can delay how many people are getting it, that means those that do get sick are going to be able to get the care that they need. Um, and we're going um, and they're going to be able to recover Um, however my passion is is that we have been banging on so much about transmission and that's really important Um, and that's all about hand washing that's respecting um, some of the things around social isolation and social distancing but our immune response so um, for those that don't understand what an immune response is Um, Inside we have like an army of little um, fighters that fight off infection every second minute of our lives. Like your body is constantly working out uh, what is good, what is bad and uh, creating an immune response to keep you healthy. Now our immunity varies from individual to individual. The reason that the elderly are getting this worse is that naturally as we get older our immunity becomes weaker. Um, And those on certain health um, conditions also have a weaker immunity. That's why they might get sicker. Um, But we can do a whole host of things to boost our immunity that are really scientifically based. Um, And and that's the message that I'd really like to concentrate on because yes, we need to follow the guidelines around washing hands and socially isolating when being asked to, but there's loads of things that we can do to increase our immunity so that when we do get exposed and um, we can get less sick great thanks that Sally. was a long introduction but I yeah yeah no 
context. Is, yes, no, we, we need that context. Can uh, before we delve into some of those like, <clears throat> sorry, real specifics of like um, what we can do to to help boost our um, immunity, just tick off quickly the and just how then highlighting the importance of some of the some of the basics that yeah. most people have probably heard about, but just to reiterate why they're important and then for you what are some of the most important things we need to do I've, in, in the chat box um my wife who is logged in has managed to send a private message which i don't know how she's done that and but obviously she's more technologically advanced than i thought saying hand uh, hand hygiene police here you've just wiped your nose with your hand a few times already so i'm got, you? no me yeah me about it so i'm actually a little bit snotty and a little bit under the weather myself right now whether that is or isn't yeah. um, coronavirus yeah. i don't know but um okay i can cover like, that how do we, yeah what what what's right. it, you know the hand washing like 20 yeah. seconds and all that sort of stuff okay. like what's the the basics gonna, and then we'll build on top of that yeah. so Jack, I'll, I'll, I'll pop around in a few minutes with a jet wash and a bottle of bleach and we'll soon sort that out <laughs> <laughs> um so in order to understand this virus um lives in secretion so things like spit and snot um, and, um, and we spread it by um, spreading those secretions, those droplets. You could cough on somebody, sneeze on somebody, you could wipe your um, nose or scratch your face and then you might have it on your hands and then you'll touch somebody else who then touches their nose and mouth. Um, and that's how it's transmitted. It also lives on surfaces for about 72 hours. So again, if you'd sneezed all over something um, and walked away and then somebody comes along and they put their hands on those surfaces, they could then infect themselves. So that's how it's transmitted. Um, and um, but so, so the ways that we can reduce transmission is, oh, it's so hard, but yes, not touching hands, face, not wiping your nose with your hands. Um, you know, if you do sneeze, do it in a tissue, throw it away. But then hand washing is the thing, like the research is so robust, like, um, and hand washing with soap, like uh, uh, soap actually helps almost like the viruses don't have bacterial walls, but they, they, they it, it kind of just dissolves when it, with soap. So, you know, hand washing with soap for 20 seconds um, is, is, is the best way of reducing uh, transmission. Um, Hot water? And, sorry? Hot water when you're... So is I think important? the issue is soap. Okay. You, if I'm really honest, um, that's where the evidence is. Now, if you, in the absence of not having that, then it's worth using some of these um, hand sanitizers. But it's not the anti-back, which kills bacteria, because this isn't a bacteria that is um, helping destroy that virus. It's usually things like the benzoyl peroxide or the alcohol that's in those, um, those squirty things that they use for your hands. So... Um, and then obviously, you know, so that's why hand washing is really important. And then the next thing in terms of isolation is that um, they say like a couple of meters between people, because actually, if you sneeze, you can sense not really far. Um, so it's all about just reducing um, transmission that way. Does that answer that initial question? I mean, these are the things that we know. This is what's going to help reduce transmission. Yeah, 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 yeah no, that's great. That's great. Yeah. There's one thing that Sally Teresa just asked, um, does it have to be antibacterial soap because there's a shortage of that? Um, no, don't waste your money. Don't waste it really. It just has to be normal soap. Like uh, the whole antibacterial thing, you need to understand in infections, we have different things. We have bacterial infections, we have fungal infections, we have viral infections, and they all respond to different things. That's why your GP always says, oh, you've got a virus, you don't need antibiotics. Like this isn't a bacteria. Um, so, you know, having anti-back um, hand sanitizer or anti-back soap isn't necessary. Um, literally normal soap is all that you need in order for that uh, virus to dissolve and um, and for it to be effective hand washing great well there's there's a there's a big take-home message for people already um, and this is just the basics <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think one oh. question to ask is what is social isolation I are uh, you know and 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 distancing I find that's quite I find that quite confusing working out, you know, what that is. Um, so, you know, is it okay to drive my car out and go and run around the woods? Is it okay to go to Gedling Park and run around the park there when there are still people walking their dogs? And, 
And so as far as I understand, like we can still get out and do those things as long as we've got that kind of couple of meters distance um, uh, from those people that we don't know. Um, obviously, if you're with your kids, you're going to be with your kids in your house. so you can all walk together. Um, so we can still be active and outside, but it's that close contact that we have to avoid. Yeah, let's let's go into that because that's going to probably start a, a number of different points that you, you're going to be able to make around uh, these things that we can do to protect ourselves. Just we've we've spoken before about the importance of getting outside and staying active and getting some fresh air. I think for, for people who are worried about sort of social isolation and if they're not showing symptoms, the yeah. idea of being indoors day in day out and especially yeah. if you've got kids is going to be crazy for people. So I've got three girls, Tim. Like the thought of all of them. <laughs> Being in the same space 24 seven, like I did panic buying last night. I bought a marble run, I bought a netball post and I bought a chess set thinking I need some things for me to do. <laughs> so just let's just touch on that a little bit about yeah. the importance of maintaining some level of normality and getting yeah. some fresh air, getting outdoors, whether that's even if it's just time in the garden or, or, yeah. or getting out because it's how, what impact does that have on our, our sort of health yeah. and well-being? Yeah. So social isolation, socially isolating, or it is not about staying indoors. You haven't got a hole up in your bed and, and you know, all battens down. Like, um, you can get outside. Like I've said, you could go for a drive in your car. Like, some people just find that really relaxing to get out. Um, and I think in terms of, like, immune boosting, we know that movement is really potent at reducing stress. Um, uh, so the knock-on effect is uh, it will improve our immunity. We also know vitamin D from our exposure to sunshine is, is, uh, is an immune modulator. And actually, we can talk a little bit about the role of taking vitamin D supplementation later because there's good evidence um, in terms of reducing the severity of respiratory disease with vitamin D. Um, and we get that from us uh, from the sunshine. So we can get that by sitting on the back step. We can get that by um, getting out in the garden. So yes, really important. But we'll touch in a minute about how utterly fundamental our sleep is. And we know that getting out in the morning suppresses our sleep hormone, melatonin, which means we're going to be more likely to have a better night's sleep that night. So, so yeah, this whole thing about um, socially isolating isn't about staying indoors. It's nothing about staying indoors. Like, um, it's about keeping distance. Uh, so, so really, really like you, you need to hear, you know, that you can be getting in your garden and actually get planting. Like it's very therapeutic. Um, if you've never grown spinach before, it's the easiest thing. I kill everything, but I can grow spinach. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and a lot of the local, uh, um, garden centers are now doing delivery things, get them to order some bulbs and some spinach and what have you. And if, even if you don't have a garden, you can do this in trays or buckets or, you your laundry basket like you can get some soil and you can plant some things so just yeah i've gone off on one sorry no but i think that's a good point because it, it stems to those mindful activities doesn't it and training for some people one of them running for me is a big one if i can go for a run in the woods it's i find it super mindful but yeah that's also going to be something where we've kind of I, I feel the anxiety at the moment in terms of yes we are going to be impacted from a business perspective social yeah. perspective there's a number of different things going on and i feel that kind of stress and tension so I almost think like I enjoy getting out and doing these things and training and, and trying to make time for that sort of stuff. It's almost like when you kind of the, 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 the kind of senses that we need to withdraw from those things, I actually feel like I need to press into them more, but just do them with, with more sort of awareness of um, intention and that sort of thing. I mean, this is a phenomenal opportunity for us as a nation to reset um, and to put some things in our life that... Um, are really important, you know, being present, family, connecting, moving, opportunity to actually cook. Like most of us are going to have to work from home and, and, uh, and we're going to have time to do some of these uh, things. So, you know, uh, uh, prioritizing sleep, we're not going to be able to go out and go to the pub. And, and, and so there is an opportunity of really creating some incredibly healthy rhythms that can then go on to reverse a whole host of other diseases. I mean, I've talked before about how the foundations I talk about can actually um, reverse, you know, your diabetes and your beta D and your heart disease and cancer rates and what have you. Like, I just, I do think we come out of this uh, a lot healthier as a nation. Yeah, it is, it is interesting that um, 
everything that we're gonna that you have talked about and we're gonna talk about are uh things that ultimately are gonna b- boost our health and you know immunity as part of that and yeah those of us that are wanting to are invested in you know phrase we use investing in your physical pension and your your physical health and and that but not just physical health your, your mental health the, the whole health of you as a as a person these things are important for um wherever we're at and I, and I like that take of um you say that this is actually a really great opportunity to do a bit of a reset um and it, it despite it's, it's a difficult time and that we've sort of um you know my, my sister's got um breast cancer and so she's massively at, um, at risk. She's got four kids and trying to, you know, are they going to get it? And then like, trying to, um, and then even worried about whether her, she's still got two more treatments to go through, like whether that should is, is still going to go ahead and all that sort of stuff. So there's, there's, um, it's nice to try and pick out something, to be able to pick out some things that are positive um, to come out of something that a lot of the time is people are feeling the stress, you know, mm-hmm when you go to the supermarket, you, it just, it just feels different because everything's just a bit crazy and there's a lot of anxiety and worry about, you know, even before we got on the call, you were talking, we were, we were both talking about how um, businesses are, are being affected and everyone's um, in that, whether you're an employee or whether you're actually a business owner. So trying to get some positives out of it, um, I think are really important. I wanted to ask one thing about, um, about getting out. Cause I think we're bringing that about saying getting outside really important because when we hear about sort of isolating yourself that you automatically think about just sort of staying inside and i've been um i say i've not been well so i've been trying to keep some distance and predominantly have been inside got outside a few times but not not as much as i probably should have done because i was probably thinking too much that i need to just stay in and that's not necessarily good for our anxiety and our mental health and whatnot as well um but if you are, so if you're under the, if you're, because there'll be other people that are like me, there'll be plenty of people with um, a bit, under, whether they've got a bit of a cold or something, or they're feeling a little bit under the weather, but not too bad. Like, what, where, what, what would your advice be for someone like that in terms of doing a bit of exercise outside or, or, or anything like that in terms of trying to help them, but not if yeah. we're under the weather a bit? I mean, it's an interesting question about when you exercise, when you're ill, full stop, isn't it? And, um, and it's one of the areas that I keep meaning to look at the research. But my understanding is in the absence of a fever, then it's fine to exercise. Um, I think sometimes, the, the, but yeah, but I would probably have to do some more research around the exercise piece and illness before I could comment. Right. Um, I mean, I can talk about some of the other things in terms of treatment you know, if you think you have the coronavirus, you want to do that. (laughs) Um, So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Go for it. I mean, just the common things. I um, I wouldn't take ibuprofen and paracetamol. Well, actually, let's talk about ibuprofen. The new government guidelines are saying do not take ibuprofen type um, drugs. So that's like Nurofen, ibuprofen. Um, They have a liquid form for kids. Um, that come under different names Um, because there's small studies that are showing that um, those that are using these type of drugs early in their illness are having poorer outcomes. So the new uh, guidelines that have been issued is that we should be avoiding ibuprofen type drugs. But I would say um, avoid anything if you can. You know, if you can get through, a fever is not a bad thing. A fever is a way of your body getting rid of an infection. Um, so I would use paracetamol if needed, but, but not necessarily. It's around rest. It's around getting your sleep. Um, it's around really um, having a good diet when you're feeling poorly. So, you know, having soups that are full of um, vegetables. If you can make bone broth, then fantastic. That's great for gut, for gut health. Um, and um, making sure that you've got lots of sort of different fruits and vegetables for their antioxidant effects. Um, Personally, there's good evidence around using vitamin C um, as a supplement, um, and that's only in terms of when we're looking at the common cold and flu. Um, So we don't know whether that translates to the coronavirus. There's not the research yet, but certainly um, you can then use anything between 500 milligrams to a gram of... um, uh, of vitamin C every sort of two or three hours 
or to something we call bowel tolerance, which means if you take too much, you end up with the runs. So, oh, so every two or three hours? Yeah, when, you, when you are sick. When you're it. sick. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you are using it just as a daily supplement and you're not unwell, yeah. we recommend just a daily dose of yeah. about a gram. Um, and uh, then also if you're unwell, you might want to consider a zinc supplement out of 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams um uh but not doing that every two or three hours just once only yeah um yeah and and then obviously if you're starting to struggle with your breathing or what have you that's when you're contacting um the medical service to ask for some advice yeah we touched on so uh, we touched on um exercise there and in, in i i guess i gave in the context of um if we are feeling under the weather exercise in general in terms of for people that are still you know so like tim talking about liking to get outside and go for a run in the woods um al um, in the chat box has asked about exercise it was one of the ones that i wanted to ask you about in terms of intensity um yeah. what well, intensity time and type like is there if we're trying to do it to make us healthy and boost our um immunity obviously yeah. exercise is a a stress and depending on how much we yeah. how much we do and how long we do it for and the intensity that we do it at is going to be yeah. have a different effect so what's is yeah. there any just guidelines for people on yeah. on on exercise when they're so if someone that's well but they're trying to do it for yeah you know, staying yeah better. so i think there's that point where um exercise causes oxidative stress and damage and is an additional stress to your body um, yeah. which can um, impact our immune response and I think it's very individual about when that when that when when chronic exercise becomes kind of that when that happens um, and so you might have somebody that can sort of run 40 minutes and it's fine but you might have somebody else and actually they're, they're tipping over in that the only really good you know kind of feedback things is using heart rate variability to see whether it's the right time to train right. um so i think it is around listening to your body if your body feels tired don't overtrain it don't over push it you know you, you're going to have to sort of be mindful and aware um, understanding that um, too much exercise can be detrimental so um, you know rest is important but i would be recommending you know you're going to do no damage by doing something for 20, 30 minutes every day. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe some of the more sort of restorative stuff, like so movement, like yoga yeah. type, you know, yeah. but there you know, are calisthenics, body weight stuff um, where we're not trying to hammer ourselves, but actually we're just trying yeah. to move well, restore a bit of range of motion. Maybe we link in a little bit of breathing with that as well, that that would be of a, of, of a low intensity. But and if you, if you have the opportunity to do that outside, then maybe we're ticking another box as well. Yeah, and um, and I and I think also we need to understand um, exercise within that wider thing of movement. You know, if we do our hip for 20, 30 minutes and then we sit all day, it's of no benefit. You know, well, it is of some benefit, but it, it, in terms of those longevity studies and the impact on uh, on health, like that kind of sitting is the new smoking. Like we need to embed our exercise practices within being active. So again, just because we're socially isolating doesn't mean we're on the sofa, you know, 24-7. Yeah. And a lot of us are going to be having to work from home, including me, with the, with the computer. So, you know, actually having to be more mindful about, um, you know, getting up and you know, walking around and getting in the garden and coming back to my computer and doing that regularly. Like, we need to be active overall because we know that has a massive impact on our stress um and uh and then within that we need to be exercising and yes absolutely mixing it up between our high intensity interval training our mobility our yoga or you know that more mindful stuff and if you don't have the facilities to um you know measure heart rate variability then it's about being mindful of whether you're tired and if you are not pushing yourself but respecting your body um I, I, but definitely it's really i mean i can't, it's, i don't have to convince your audience like they they are active aren't they so yeah, um, yeah I think there's a question from al uh, following up about um going for a more moderate heart rate like during exercise so could that be that him doing more having more rest in between sets and i just want to sort of say potentially but also don't um see what you think about this sally but the in the current state that we're at, like maybe we 
maybe our training changes a little bit because one, we might not be at the gym and you might train at home and you haven't got therefore the same equipment, but also we might take just for a couple of weeks, a slightly different approach where we don't hammer the intensity so much. And we put some of those goals that we've got on the back burner just to go, right, I'm just, the exercise I'm going to do is not to improve my human flag. It's going to be to just improve my like health and wellness so that I don't get ill during this period so that when we come off the back of it, we can get back into normality I haven't had a period where I've had to like yeah. completely detrain and deload because I've ended yeah. up making myself ill. Is that, is that a fair point? Yeah. And I, and no, it sounds really sensible and I'm probably looking to you guys to answer some of those questions. Cause my, you know, I'm a generalist, I'm a GP, that's my background. And, and so, you know, the whole sports physiology, there's so much to learn and it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. And, and so I, I tend to deal with a lot of normal people where it's yeah. just getting them moving and getting them thinking about exercise and, you know, certainly in other scenarios, knowing the benefit of hits and, and different types of exercise um, and how that impacts our hormones and what have you. So, but, but I get to a point where actually I'm at the edge of my knowledge. Um, yeah. What do you so, think, Tim? Yeah, I was going to say, I'll jump in and just give my thoughts on that one. And from experience of training athletes, what we do with those guys, if they present to be sick, um, and then also from my own experience of training when I'm sick, um, the first point that I wanted to make is that it, we've got to kind of move away from this place of feeling like I have to train. This addiction of if I don't train, I'm going to lose all those gains. And, and I've been in that place myself where it's a cycle of, of feel like I've got to train. So I've got a cold and I'm feeling sick and I'm run down, but I've got to go to the gym because that's more important. I'll be fine. I'll toughen up and, and get through it. And what I've learned from that is it doesn't help. Like it doesn't really help me feel good because I probably had a bad session because I don't feel great. And then it's not going to help me to be the recovery. And to Sally's point around, it's, it's cumulative stress, right? Like, so the body and the brain isn't going to go, well, this is emotional stress and anxiety about the current situation. This is physical stress. So I'm going to deal with these two things a little bit differently. It's all going to require some level of recovery, regeneration and um, to deal with. And, and I think for me, my advice around that is just listen to your body, but, but, it, but, listen carefully if it if you are telling yourself that you have to do this because you feel like you should train but actually you don't really feel like it if you're brutally honest do something like go for a walk take some time out because it's everyone's in often in a short-term rush to try i've got to get this this session in this week and we always say look it's not it doesn't really matter what you're doing one week or two weeks it's what you're gonna do over six months which is going to make the difference so just play the long game with the training and when you're at home and, and the sort of situation is a little bit different to normal just and you're not feeling great or for, for me like if you want to go and smash yourself because all of a sudden you've got more time you're not leaving a lot of capacity and scope to sort of deal with the other stuff that you've got going on so i would just encourage people to sort of just, just be sensible listen to people be honest with yourself and don't feel like you're backwards we have these undulations in our training all the time if we have athletes that come in and present sick with cold and that sort of stuff we back off we give them time. We don't go, right, well, it sucks that you've got a cold. Let's just keep hammering on. We'll give them time to recover and we'll send them home. We don't want them around other athletes that aren't sick. So if we're on a training camp, somebody comes up with a cold or, or some other kind of, um, you know, they've got a stomach upset or something, they get isolated and they, and they, or they'll get sent home because we don't want that around and it's not useful for them to train. So I think it's, we, we are sometimes our worst enemies when it comes to training when we're sick because we force ourselves to do something that we actually don't really feel like we want to do or should yeah. do if we do it anyway. I think as you said there Tim you um you you'd you'd send you know you just wouldn't you would your you would say to an athlete right you, you know, I mean the person making the decision the SNC coach the doctor would say right well you're not off you're off training today because you're ill and at no point are we worried about them losing all their gains whereas when we get to make the decision ourselves because we're not part of a, a, a team like that, it's then more difficult to make that disciplined um, decision to, to back off, but just encourage people with what you said that like have that discipline because it's not going to, you just need, don't believe the lie that you're going to lose all your gains just because you have um, a couple of sessions off or a week off during, during whilst, uh, whilst you're being ill. Yeah, and I think the important thing on that is it's energy levels. So if an athlete walks in and they've got a bit of a runny nose and you have a conversation, you go, how are you feeling? You go, do you know what? Like, I've got this cold, but I feel good. Like, I'm good to go. Then we'll, we'll train. But if they come in and they're like, oh, you know what? I'm just tired. You can tell by their demeanor that they're not up for it. Then, then we back off. So it's, it's being very sort of honest and, and, um, and just be like, find a bit of peace in it. Go, it's okay if I don't train today. It's not the end of the world. 
Sally, I don't know if you've got anything there which is helpful. Yeah, it helps me. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> I mean, I just, um, I think I learned so much from training with Jacko over the years. I mean, I used to do those hit sessions every morning and and really drive my body into the ground. And, that wasn't um, with that bit. Wasn't with me. No, that wasn't with you. And, <laughs> um, and I was always hurting myself. And actually, when I started training with Jacko, it was just a revelation to trust myself, trust my body, listen to what it could do. And and actually, within months, I think my body was the strong it had ever been and I really enjoyed exercise and enjoyed my body like and um and so yeah I reiterate what you know what you're saying um I think yeah listen to 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 your body when you're ill yeah and I think one of the questions that have uh, that have come in Jack if we just may yeah. pick up on these quickly yeah I'll just um, last bit just on exercise yeah, on. Tim um that if so if we're in terms of like the research out there if we're trying to do it to like improve our um improve our immunity that moderate exercise and that sort of being able if you're if you're running that you could actually potentially hold a bit of a conversation uh, resistance training wise that may be sort of comfortably able to do 15 reps um, with good form that's that's the sort of level where we're going to be at in terms of trying to the adaptation we're looking for is to help us boost our immunity and, and from that respect rather than it being a a strength session where I'm going to get stronger for this goal I'm going to do. And it might be that I know for me personally, I might, I'm going to take a little bit of that um, because I'm a little bit under the weather and don't, I need to make sure that I'm trying to listen to, to my body in that way. And actually the exercise, I want to use exercise to make me more robust in terms of my immunity during this period rather than anything else. So a little shift in sort of goals or adaptation that we're, we're after. Yeah, that sounds right. good. Jacko. Good summary. Uh, so Sally's going to throw a couple of questions at you. There's one that we've missed from um, Mike Perry, just um, going back to vitamins and we'll come back to the training. So um, Mike says, if vitamin C helps us fight the cold or flu, uh, could that mean that our immunity would have more available to fight coronavirus if we are sort of supplementing already? If I've understood that correctly, Mike. I haven't understood that question. Sorry. Just... Mike, just, just clarify that again for us in terms of that, that question around having... Um, sort of uh more available vitamin c michael is no, i think it was meaning c. so i read that as um if vitamin c helps to fight f cold and flus yeah would it mean our we'd have more of you like your immune system wouldn't be have it would be a little bit not having to fight off that cold and flu so your immune system might be able to help fight the coronavirus a bit more effectively that's how i understood it yeah i mean it's an interesting question that actually if we you know, flu is around at the moment. It's filling the hospitals. We're dealing with our usual winter epidemic of flu, which we, well, epidemic's wrong word, win winter rise in um, flu. Um, and actually, what if you do have an infection, um, it, it can impact your immunity and make you more prone to other infections. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but in terms of whether the research around using vitamin C in flu and and the common cold can be translated to the coronaviruses. We just don't know, but um, the common sense thing would say, you know, possibly. So the thing is, the coronavirus has only been around, this particular coronavirus, the COVID-19, has only been around, you know, for a few months, and research is emerging. I mean, I was reading all of the research that they're doing on the moment, um, and, it just, and it's just coming out, and we're just trying to make sense of it. Um, yeah. But so, but if you have got a cold, so one thing I took away from it was that, like, if you've got a bit of a cold flu, like I have at the moment, then I can actually up the amount yeah. of vitamin C that I yeah. that and I it's take. A no, it's a no harm approach. You know, yeah. you, if you don't use it, you pee it out. So you might waste a few pounds in terms of money. But um, I've yeah. got a big tub from bulk powders. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> great it's cheap yeah. vitamin c in powder format yeah. yeah um just one more on training then so andy shaw what's the view on exercise for the over 70s and especially high-risk people with underlying conditions for being socially isolated oh gosh i think it's the same as what we've discussed yeah. um i would say the benefit of getting outside walking um staying active um so embedding exercise within that context of being active is really important whether that's in the garden weeding um you know or driving out and going for a walk around the woods or um yeah, yeah. it's exactly the same advice yeah, yeah. and i think that just the, what that exercise looks like is exactly that for you know, if i think of my dad is um 
is over 70 he's got asthma so he's um at risk but that so exercise his exercise is going to look very different to mine it might be like you say it might be gardening but it might be going for a walk but yeah. combine it yeah. think about going for a walk outside and, and gardening as you're combining yeah. that getting outside yeah. it can still yeah. be a safe distance away from yeah. other people and whatnot but it yeah. gets that it gets us into yeah. the outside hopefully the sunshine will actually come out as well <laughs> it will. and i think to say in. like you know for those with health conditions and over 70s like this isn't suddenly the time to you know be really pushing it and be muscle sore and you know starting to train for some marathon no it's just about you know the evidence is really good around just being active it's you know actually yeah. walking is one of the best things when you're looking at longevity studies better than the marathon runners like so you, it really is what your situation is where what your starting point is and you know making sure that you enjoy it um uh, and just getting away from this kind of sitting on the couch all the time or sitting at our laptops all the time just keeping active is is the key message and then those more specialized things because you guys are the coaches around you know your programs you know i look to you for that advice and i think you've done a great summary already jacko yeah well i think for andy asking that question the, um, the answer was always going to be something more like that it depends it was never going to be three sets of 10 pike push-ups and if they're isolated at home put the feet up on the sofa um yeah you know, it's just it allows us to be yeah making sure that we are are being sensible with with that as much as as but that's the same as as um whether we weren't even talking about the sort of current situation with the health climate if it was just what should what should a 70 year old do well it's going to be it's going to be based on a lot of a lot of different things anyway um yeah. Micah said thank you. Andy has said thank you. Before, we, there's a couple of questions about um, like fasting, and I wanted to get into some of the more like dietary things um, yeah. in a second. I just wondered whether we could just finish off any other. Um, you mentioned zinc, and you mentioned vitamin C. Yeah. Um, you mentioned vitamin D in terms of um, the sunshine. I wanted yeah. to just cover off any other like supplements. Like, should yeah. would would you ever recommend like? Uh, supplementing with vitamin d um yeah. i'd seen some stuff on vitamin a and like for immunity and and yeah. cod liver oil it's called about a and d yeah Is that right and then like so would you we would you recommend any of those yeah um so i think um just to put context to help people know where we're going, we, you know, we're talking about the five foundations to health. We've covered movements. We've dipped in a little bit about stress and we'd really need to talk about sleep and nutrition and connection yes. as well. Um, so the supplementation thing, um, I, I would be on a good multivitamin, but is there research or evidence about it? Um, probably not. It's not great, but it's another no harm approach. And certainly I take that and that's what I would give my kids. Um, as just part of just generally being healthy, not no more than that. And and the rationale behind that is these minerals and vitamins that our body need to operate, just not in our food anymore. So even when we're really making that effort to eat a whole food diet, we might be missing out on key things. So good multivitamins just covering um, some of that. Great. Well, Sam asked that right at the beginning, so. Yeah, that. and uh, and then uh, I think there's good research around um, D3. Um, so that, you know, vitamin D is our sunshine vitamin. We also get it from egg yolks, um, fish, um, mushrooms. Um, and uh, we have a vitamin D sort of receptor on nearly every cell in our body and it modulates our immunity. It's very involved in our immune response. And there are bits of research, not about the coronavirus, but certainly in other respiratory diseases that show that people who are vitamin D deficient have worse outcomes. Um, and so, um, and actually it's, it's in the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and Excellence Guidelines um, nationally that all pregnant women should be on a multivit or ch all young kids should be on a, uh, no, sorry, on a vitamin D, sorry. Mm -hmm. So all pregnant women should be on a vitamin D, um, all children should be on vitamin D, all the elderly should be on a vitamin D. If you're covered, you should be on vitamin D. Um, and because of our climate um, and uh, we're not getting the sunshine, um, actually most of us should just be on a vitamin D supplementation. Like deficiency is just massive. In terms of how much to take, the best way is to get testing, but you won't get into your GP at the moment to get that <laughs> yeah. um, in order to work out how much you need. But um, for um, children, um, I'd recommend, oh gosh, I might have to look that up actually and get back to you. No, yeah, for children, um, 
it's 1,000 international units. Um, and for adults, it's, it's about 2,000 international units as a maintenance supplement. Um, so certainly I would um, encourage people just generally outside of this setting of the coronavirus, you know, that they should be on a vitamin D supplement. And that's not weird or wacky. That's in our guidelines nationally. Yeah. What does international unit mean? Oh, it's a measure. So you can get it as some, I think, 25 micrograms, which is that UG on yeah. the end, is equivalent to 1,000 international units. So it's just a measure of how they write on the packet, how much is in it. Because right. most of the time they're put down in like milligrams or whatever, will it not? Yeah. Yeah. So vitamin D can come in either. Um, so, yeah. Does that so anyway so multivitamin vitamin d we've spoken about vitamin c i don't use a vitamin c supplement on a general day to day basis because i have a very plant-based diet but i've always for years and years if i've got the sniff of a cold i've done what i've suggested where i take between 500 milligrams and a gram um every two or three hours um, until i start feeling very be um, better um, there is also evidence that a lot of us are zinc deficient. The ideal thing would be able to measure that. We don't have the right test on the NHS. Um, so uh, again, you know, we're supposed to have between 25 and 50 milligrams of zinc a day. So it would be, um, and certainly that zinc is very involved in our immune response. So you might want to do, have some zinc when you're ill. Um, and then I've always supplemented with fish oils because that's also very, um, our omega-3 is a very important in our immune response and, and, and in inflammation. Um, and for those that are vegan, you, you can get that, um, you get these algae ones, don't you, that do omega-3 as well. So that kind of wrap that up. We can put yeah. that down, can't we? You you, does the, is your omega-3 cover your, uh, your cod liver oil? Just because yeah. like the ratio between three, six and nine quite. Yeah. 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 So um, I don't think, um, I don't think there's like a head to head study between cod liver oil and then diff the different omega types of omega three. And I don't think there's even the studies to know how much you should be taking. Right. Um, so, um, but I do, you know, I, I have oily fish in my diet, but my daughter's vegetarian. So I have her on, uh, um, you know, a fish oil supplement or an yeah. omega three supplement. Is that a cod liver oil? Uh, the one that I use. Yeah. The cod liver oil is different from from okay. fish oil. So and cod liver oil has A and D in. So, um, but yeah, it would be a good substitute. Yeah. Cool. So and we we've got quite a few questions coming around um, fasting, Sally. So yes. obviously we want to sort of make sure that we are. Um, good, people can go back to listen to to the previous podcast if you want some more advice on general sort of nutrition. But as you said, going back to eating whole food diet, yeah. ideally knowing where those things have come from. Yeah. Um, get a large amount of plant based foods and, and yeah. eating the rainbow. You often talk about as well. So if you yeah. want to give a few kind of short headlines, if there's anything else yeah. around that, but um, no. recovering stuff. No, um, I mean the, the big thing is as a nation, fifty percent of our food is processed and it's killing us. Like there's no way around it like any any population that adopts a western diet gets sick and and the reason is that we aren't created to eat this kind of stuff can we do it occasionally fine yeah absolutely but we need to start pulling away from processed foods um, and adopt uh, a love for cooking again or learn to cook and and start eating a whole food diet um, and what is uh, processed food? It's anything that's been in a factory and it doesn't look like its original form. That's what I always say. Um, so yeah, looking for sort of nutrient dense whole food, eating the rainbow because it has all those different vitamins and phytonutrients and are really good for gut health. Um, and I've talked before about how like 70% of our immunity is in our gut. So we need to be looking after those gut bacteria and looking after our gut. And we do that by kind of feeding it all these wonderful different prebiotic foods. Um, we need a good source of protein. Um, so, you know, uh, about a gram per kilo um, a day. So if I'm, a, you know, I'm 70 kilos, so I'd be looking at getting 70 grams of protein a day. Um, if you're a vegetarian, um, except outside of quinoa, like, um, you know, plant-based proteins are not complete, so you need to mix them up so that you can get the full array of amino acids that you need. Um, I would not be eating um, vegan uh, 
a meat substitute, they're, they're, they're produced in the factory, fine if you're okay with using eating processed food, but you need to see that it is processed food and, it, and it's, not, it's not a natural food and it's not a great source of protein. So I'll be looking for protein in your lentils and peas and beans and oats and all of those things. And then fermented foods, great for gut bacteria as well. So your kimchi and, um, you know, your fermented vegetables and your kombuchas. Um, and then there are some lovely studies on different foods that are very antiviral or antibacterial. So your garlics, your turmeric, your onions, your ginger, um, all the wonderful spice, spices. Like there's a lot of stuff kind of in that kind of... Um, you know, either under the microscope or in animal studies that have shown um, that they have benefits and some in smaller human studies um, that uh, you know, can benefit your immunity. Um, I wouldn't supplement with those things. I would eat them. Um, and, uh, and again, it's a no harm approach. Can I, ask, can I ask you a specific ginger question? Yeah. Yes, um, I might not be able to answer it. Mrs. And I think Mrs. Jacko requested this one. Yeah. That, um, she was like, when you see Asuka, um, we put in, like, we, we both like it anyway, like like raw gin, like putting ginger into shakes or starting to have it in teas yeah. and whatnot as well. Is there, is, it, is there any difference or much better to have it compared to a powdered form that you can just buy in Zoom like compared to, that? what's the... Yeah, What's the I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I would have to go and look up the research. And your wife is very competent <laughs> doing a PubMed search herself and answering that question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I feel like when you chop it up fresh and you get that in your... your yeah, your... I suppose it's also got all those lovely, you know, prebiotic fibres and fibre and yeah. so you're benefiting things in another way. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is you... Yeah, but we could go on study about. about Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, no, quick one, just to wrap that up, and then let's go to fasting. So just the, the point that you make, like, just thinking about how I um, eat, and am I getting those sorts of things in my diet? It goes back to that thing of love of cooking. And if you learn to cook, you're just doing all of that. Like, you make foods with different spices and ginger and garlic, and you're eating Indian food, and it just kind of happens as a result yeah. of cooking as opposed to actually going out of your way to go and consume these things. So I think that's like a really good takeaway. Yes. Let's talk fasting because there's been a few questions from, from a number of different people. We've touched on fasting, well, we went into depth on fasting um, previously. Is fasting something which is appropriate during this time that we're in? Um, is it something that we should be thinking about? And if so, benefits or potential contraindications? Um, so um, fasting is just incredible um in any form don't care if you want to do a water only fast an intermittent fast a time restricted eating um it the the benefits are really profound especially on our immune system and i think that's really well established in the science i don't think anybody would refute that at all um i think the cautions around fasting are people with eating disorders um, people who may have medical conditions that mean they're malnourished um, uh, so i would certainly be cautious in those settings but outside of those settings definitely i think fasting should be a part of our rhythm and routine um, in life. Um, the way I do it, um, you know, and I think it really is found in finding something that works for you. You don't want to be stressing your body out at the moment. Uh, we've got enough stress on board, but I find like um, I uh, eat at about 11 o'clock in the morning. I'll have a cup of coffee first thing in the morning, black coffee, and then I'll eat up till about eight o'clock and then I won't uh, eat outside of those hours. I'll only drink um, water um, and um, sort of black tea, black coffee. And, and so it's really finding that works for you, but you don't even have to be that extreme. I mean, the evidence is it, it kicks in even if you're kind of just doing 12 hours restricted eating. Um, so uh, my husband's calling me, how ridiculous I'm <laughs> lost you but anyway so, so it line. might be that you just um you just you know just eat between eight and eight you're still going to get some benefits um to your immune system um and you might want to then play maybe on a monday and tuesday i'll just extend that and i'll go you know i'll go from 11 to eight on those days or some people you know find a rhythm where actually they just do a 24-hour thing where they only drink water 
um, and, and that is, is of great benefit. There are no studies head to head that compare all of these things, but I think the science is there that all of these things can have great benefit to our immune system. Yeah, couldn't, because one of the question from um, Ali saying about um, Dr. Rona Patrick saying that over 30, like over 30, extending over 36 hours creating autophagy, which can help replacing um, white blood cells, but it was something done, might have only been done in rats or something, but just the idea of if we're trying to do something to help our immune system, yeah. is some level of fasting, if we're all, if we're sort of currently fit and well to help with that, is, yeah. is that therefore something that you're saying would be good for people and find something that works for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so finding some form of fasting that works for you is of going to be great benefit. And you don't have to restrict that long, I think, for that whole, you know. Yes, that's what I, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I, I would have to go and do the research, bring it together and be able to kind of present on that, I think. like um, I had heard on a podcast um, from another doctor talking about, yeah. it was on one of Chris Cresson talking about... Um, 13 hours plus or something in and yeah, around there. Yeah, so. yeah, my understanding is it was literally, you know, the reason we call it break fast, breakfast, you know, breakfast is that, that we were breaking a fast and it's, the, and it's that fasted, that extended period without food that's doing all this wonderful thing. And, and I think we don't need to understand the mechanisms, but because the outcomes are, you know, that it, it's a benefit to our health and reducing chronic disease and helping our immunity yeah and just to make sure that because there was confusion someone commented on the last when we just discussed oh, we water, fasting last time that water fasting water fast, they thought that that meant <laughs> no um, water. not having any water rather than uh, a water, water fast mean water only um and were you saying find what works for you there's all you know there's different types I, I guess fasting in a way just means like restricting something you know you talked before about just having like it could be that you just have a a much lower calorie day compared to just only on on water or it might be that we we miss one certain meal just some level of giving or my understanding of be of it a case of like giving the gut a bit of a break or a little bit of an easier ride in terms of it, it having to digest all the food we're, tr we're trying to have so just i almost see it as like a slight a change from what you normally do and that might be only consuming water or it might be yeah. You, you, you're just going to simpler foods or you know there's different ways that we can do this in different lengths of time people have to do yeah. it and i think it's important jacko it's not a change from what we normally do because you might have habits where yeah. you know every day you might like do something you're going to get the benefit from that just so you know it's not because you're you're tricking you're not doing something in your body yeah, that's sorry yeah then, then you know switches on your immunity it's it's more having those things where your body has your body's got a whole host of other things to do than just digest and yeah so, um yeah does that is that clear yeah i think let's um i'm just conscious of time for people there's one thing that i think is is really important sally that um i think you mentioned before around uh, one of the other sort of pillars of connection and in a time where we're being told to um stay away from each other or that's as much as it kind of can feel like um we're being sort of told to isolate just touch on the importance of connection yeah. and interaction and community and how do we go about it in times like this because yeah. i think probably one of the worst things we can do is shut ourselves away yeah. um, and not, yeah. not engage with other people yeah so i mean again going back to those five foundations like we've looked at movement we've touched a little bit on stress we've looked at the nutrition piece um, and the connection piece yeah like social isolation is such a potent driver of all chronic disease it's it's highly stressful to a body and highly inflammatory and and i think i don't like that they use the word social isolation because social isolation doesn't need to mean to me disconnection and, and it's very, very important that we stay um, connected um, because yes, that can compound um, you know, a whole host of problems as well as have a massive impact on our mental health. Like one in four of us of adults have you know, sought help from a GP in the last year about mental health issues. It's just so prevalent. And, and so I think we need to be really creative. And I think the wonderful thing is in our our climate with the use of you know, technology is that we can be connected 
Um, and so, so I really think it's so important that we start thinking how we do that and how we stay um, connected with each other because it's, it is paramount in terms of um, us maintaining our mental health as well as uh, maintain our physical health and it will impact our immune response because it's because social isolation is a hugely stressful thing and we know stress suppresses our immunity so um, connections very important and I you know I think there's also lovely you know evidence around a sense of connection with purpose and maybe this is a really important time where we um, as a nation as an individuals and families consider well what is our purpose you know why are we here and what do we want to do with our lives like it's certainly for me it's really sobering isn't it like um, my business is all over the place at the moment and having to kind of think gosh what is important and you know am I doing what I, I want to be doing and am I going to be going where I want to go and so it's a beautiful time in terms of reflecting and thinking and you know reconnecting with that sense of purpose in your life and as families um, so yeah and, and then I talk about connection with self like actually when we're disconnected from ourself you know also that really feeds into mental health issues um, which in turn can cause problems, you know, uh, with inflammation and anxiety and what have you. And, 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 uh, and the reason that we're so disconnected with ourselves is that we are just bombarded all the time with so much distraction, our phones, TVs, work, blah, 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 blah. It just goes on and on. And again, what a beautiful opportunity for us to actually get more mindful and get more present and have less things in our life that, that we can actually start reconnecting with ourselves, reconnecting with others, reconnecting with our purpose. And, and that will re be really potent in terms of healing and, and the impact on health. Yeah. I think that comes nice to back around to what you said, the relative early doors of going like, this is a potential for us to do a bit of a, bit of a reset. Um, and yeah, no, I really like that. And you know, Owen Beardshaw had, had, had got asked a question about basically about this, about the sort of um, mental health side of things of being isolated and that uh, affecting yeah. anxiety as a result. And he's mentioned sort of social media, and you, you talked about it there. We well, talked about technology being actually being able to a good thing to be able to keep us connected, but yeah. at the same time, it actually stops us being mindful. And I think it's now is a really good time to look at how we use the technology that we've got and go, yeah. how am I going to use this positively to help me with that connection rather than it being like disconnected me from myself and, and surroundings. And yeah. I know everybody will struggle with that to, to some yeah. degree, depending on what's, um, yeah. what's going on in your life and what your current sort of like work life balance is like and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we found through, um, through, through the through training calisthenics that that connection with others is is massive why the community side of things has been such a, a positive thing that's come out of what we've essentially yeah. what sort of organically came out of the school calisthenics and I, tim would uh, agree with the same um and i think that's it's yeah. one of the things now is going like when we are going to be potentially separated more than we would usually be like not like this is a great example normally me and tim would do the podcast sat next to each other together whereas we're on the we're on the call today um and and i think that's where using how you choose to use that technology you know be you know if you are if you're part of the virtual classroom or and you use the community aspect in there or whether you use your your video phone to to have a call with your your family that yeah. you wouldn't normally actually do in person. It might not be as good as me in person, but it's going to be a yeah. lot better than that that isolation. And I think that's hey. yeah, yeah. It reiterates that point, doesn't it? Of like mm -hmm. that whole thing of like isolating doesn't mean you have to. Like I had a message from a friend today that said my dad isolating himself is probably going to kill him more than the coronavirus would do if he got it. Um, and trying to make sure that that isolation isn't stopping us from going outside it isn't stopping us from actually staying connected with people in the world yeah, yeah. i mean uh, we spent 30 minutes last night trying to get my mother to connect mm. to zoom so we yes. family could all talk we had a view of her nostril for a long time on mute so, <laughs> but you know eventually we did get there and it was a lovely time together to all feel that sense of connection um, and I really feel for people with mental health. It's almost I worry the most. And, um, and certainly, like, I've just started a YouTube channel that I'm hoping to put something out each day 
but I'm, the plan is in the, in the coming weeks is to do some stuff around mental health. And so I've certainly suffered with my own mental health historically, and it can just be such a vulnerable time. Like I think we, we hear this whisper that we're alone and, and that can be the worst lie to buy into. And, and so, yeah, I, my, my heart really goes out and I, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, um, we'll put this, send me the, the link to your YouTube channel and we'll put more, we'll make sure we'll put the link in the show notes because I'm sure people yeah, listening. Dr. Will Sally want Bell can look me up if you forget. Look on, yeah. Look up on, <laughs> Sally Bell on YouTube, but we'll put the you link subscribe. in the show. I've only got two subscribers. One's my mum and one's my husband. Okay, well, subscribe. you'll get one more. We'll, we'll give you one and then we'll see if we can get any others in. Let's get Sally to 10. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone started yeah. with zero, Sally. Yeah, yeah. We all start somewhere. Brilliant. I'm just yeah. going to wrap this up, Sally, just respect yeah. um, the time from, from yourself and everybody else. So just one question that's coming from Jed around a ketogenic diet. And what I'm going to do is just refer Jed to go back and search on iTunes on our, um, on our podcast for the previous sessions that we've done with you because you went into some detail on that there. So if, you, if you've got any more sort of questions or you want to understand a bit more about sort of Sally's philosophy um, and the way that she, some of the other detailed information um, go back and listen to those podcasts There's two of them we went into a ton of detail around that so if this day has been a sort of like a bit of a, a summary of everything and, and you can get some more information from yeah. before we wrap just up, wrap up from my, Tim, yeah, yeah you go, we go have yeah. to talk about sleep because it is the oh, yes. fundamental thing that we can do to boost our immunity if you have less than six hours sleep for one night, you significantly reduce your natural killer cells, which are your kind of surveillance around um, killing things that um, you first get exposed to. And, and the research, you know, beyond just natural killer cells, but the other aspects are our immunity and even our immunity against viruses is just so robust. Like sleep deprivation is just a massive immune suppressant. And it's something that we can so easily, you know, address, especially now that we're not going to be going out every night and so I really want to say like one of the biggest things that you can do before you worry about your movement and all your other pieces is get sleep habits in place and if people um, struggle with sleep on my website there's a resource section and I've got some sleep hygiene stuff there and I've blogged about sleep before and I will be talking about sleep in more detail on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, but but I really really want to say that people in this time prioritize your sleep you know, aim for sort of seven and a half to nine hours asleep, not in bed. Make sure your sleep is restorative um, and follow my sleep hygiene rules if sleep is an issue. But for some people, they just need to prioritize it. And it's just the most fundamental thing that we can put in place to protect us. I went to bed at half past eight last night. Ooh. Throw that out there. Yeah. I do that most nights. And that's not because I used to go out every night and now I don't go. I didn't used to go out, but I, and that's why I know that I'm a bit run down because I can, I literally was more than happy to go to bed. I was out like a light. Um, well, these things are challenging, right? I think this is one thing I listened to on the radio the other day. They, um, on Five Live, and they were talking about waking up to a, like a new normal. And for us, we're sort of like, now Jack can't go to my mum and dad's where he would normally spend some portion of the week because my mum and dad are both sort of around 70 and, and we want to try and protect them. So now Jack's going to be at home a little bit more. So I've gone, well, I've still got quite a lot of work to do. Business is kind of going through this kind of adapt to what it looks like. So I'm going to get up earlier and then I'm kind of still going to bed at the same time. And I've done that for two days and now I'm tired. Um, and I just, it's, it's kind of like finding this new normal, pressing into some of the stuff. And I think there's some amazing advice in there and going back to the basics of sleep well, eat well. There's some great supplementary stuff that we can do around boosting um, immune system. Can we seek physical connection with other people? How, what does that look like? We don't self uh, social isolation doesn't mean being stuck indoors. It means being yeah. sensitive about where we go and, and how yeah. we go about conducting those things. Yeah. I think hopefully the takeaway from this is like press into basics, work out what normal is going to look like for the, for the kind of foreseeable future. But also we should probably just kind of like take some weight off our shoulders. I, I kind of feel heavy with all this stuff at the moment. And I think it's taking some time out, not to just kind of get caught in the, in the kind of humdrum of flow of where we're being kind of the world is closing in and just take some time to step back, breathe and go, Do you know what? These are things I can control. These are the basics. And these are the way that I'm going to be going about these things based on the current environment and i kind of feel like we just need to take things a day at a time at the moment and just yeah. because it's changing quickly, the advice can change quickly but these things that we've talked about today are consistent and we can continue to do those for as long as actually probably as you said a reset probably should be more like forever habits anyway yeah that sounds good yeah and hopefully 
And manage your stress. We didn't talk about that either. <laughs> Another time. She's angling for a session four, Jacko. <laughs> she's done three now. Oh, she's, she, she keeps this stuff back right to the end. She's like, I've got this as well. She wants a fourth episode. I think some of those... SOC doctor. We just need to give you a job title. Yeah, no, exactly. You are now the official SOC doctor. Um, yeah. We can definitely we can definitely do that, but then but like some of those some of those things that we've discussed and putting those into putting just some of those things into practice is going to help people with managing some you know help people managing their stress. Some of those things Absolutely. are these stressors. Um, or quickly on um, Andy Shaw just asked about napping, and Tim mentioned then about low sleep. There's a podcast we did with Nick Littlehales. Um, he's a sleep expert, so do check that one out. But essentially, like. Get it if you if you can get more sleep in, as you said, um, that's going to be beneficial. And so, whether it's I've actually through having a nap, that's also cool. I've actually done a lot of experimenting and research on naps personally. <laughs> and in my case, if n equals one, nap away more the better. <laughs> right, Sally? Naps are good. I, I don't. I don't get the opportunity to nap. But if you but if you could, you would. You, you, know. you want to try it sometime? I think. Amazing. Afternoon. On the napping thing, I think if napping doesn't interfere with your sleep at night, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, I just wanted to so f- just for m- for my final sort of thoughts on this, Sally. Like, massively, thank you for coming um, on and actually reaching out to us to to go. Let's let's do this because it was a great um, idea. And I think, like, to reiterate what Tim said, um, feeling a bit heavy. Like, I yeah, I have been feeling. Um, stressed and anxious about it like we were away at the weekend and and yeah the climate just like changed and then going into a supermarket and seeing stuff I mean someone mentioned on the on the chat about um toilet rolls and that sort of stuff and and sometimes there's been as ever during these times when something like this happens or something difficult goes on we end up seeing like both sides of of humanity people snatching things off each other in a supermarket on one side and being all about me and then other hearing stories of other people where they're sending letters through neighbors' doors saying, if you need any help, like I'm John at 36 and, um, you know, I can get you this, that, the other. And so I've, from everything you've said, I feel, and I hope everyone else that's been listening to, I feel so much, uh, more positive, um, about it and feel like you've given us some real, practical things that we can that we can do to feel like we're in control i always find um situations where i'm there's uncertainty i don't know what's going to happen like when i had my head injury with rugby i didn't know when what was going to happen with that i didn't know when i was going to get better and that uncertainty was always one of the most difficult things i think we struggle with and at the the moment there's that anxiety i think is a lot of it is linked to that uncertainty and you giving us those things that we can do those that what tim mentioned right right at the beginning control the controllables the things that we can control let's make sure that we're doing those to the best um of our ability and then and within doing that helping others to do to do the same because i'm conscious that at times we sort of laugh and joke about little things that we're talking about and there's everyone's in different situations and for some people um for some people, they're not as worried about this because they're fitting well and they're not in that, they're not in that situation or not in one of those categories of being uh, more vulnerable. And for other people, it's, it's potentially life and death. And so um, I just hope that people have, have got some stuff that they can either help for themselves or pass on to help with others um, and that yeah. you feel a little bit less stressed and anxious um, as, as I do so. I guess a thank you from from me um, yeah. and Tim as well as everyone listening as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, you can find me on drsallybell.com and um, Dr. Sally Bell at Instagram and Facebook and what have you. So I'm just hoping to put some of this sensible stuff out and drip feed the nation some great things that they can do for their health. So join the movement. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I've just wanted, Great, someone. Someone just sent me a private message in the chat box. Mike Perry, you can see my clock in the background. It says your clock's wrong. That <laughs> clock is strategically twenty minutes fast, or about ninety minutes fast, which is in the hope of trying to get Mrs. Jacko to something on time at some point in her life. I was going to say, let's not go into why that, that clock is, <laughs> is that fast, because you and I both know if she's listening. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right guys you guys have been awesome thanks so much for joining us um and again follow up if you want to share this and um, when we're going to go out um next week jacko is that right as a podcast yeah this is going to be out if you're listening either 
yeah, it's going to be out on Wednesday next week. So it's going to be next week's podcast. Some of you are listening. It is next week now that you listen to it, et cetera. But um, yeah, if when it is out, if you want to re-listen to it, obviously do that. But please, um, if you feel like the information in there, and I certainly do, is is beneficial that Sally has said, share that with um, as many people as you like to. Um, and then also just to remind you, one thing that we've done to try to know a lot, we know a lot of people are um, at home and being able to do some exercise at home, we have made our Bodyweight Basics Bundle, which includes principles of strength, movement, and play, uh, movement, strength, and play, uh, which was a £40 bundle. We've made it absolutely free. Um, so to try and help people in terms of getting into some training with their body weight at home. Um, so that is a, yeah, that's, that's something we've done to try and uh, help you enjoy your training at home. I'm going to do that, Jacko. Oh. Yeah, the body weight basis is free now. Oh, Get on yeah. it. Oh, I've been okay. sat here for an hour and 15 minutes wondering why you've not got a set of rings hanging from that beam behind you. Oh, no. Oh, is that, <laughs> is that my what bike? you got a what bike? You ain't been that off. You, well, buy yeah, about you need spin. some rings. You could buy about a, th- a thousand sets of rings for that one I what could, bike. I could take you out the back and I've got a set of rings on a pull-up bar. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, outside, you see. Yeah, well yeah. done. Yeah. That is better. And it's outside and unused for some months. So when it gets a bit Look warm. Look at that rings, what bike, and a log burner. That's like heaven for me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going around. You're going to come around. You're asking me about the basics. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Good. all right let's sign off so this is time number three so we're going to do the official ending um so you know what you've got to do yeah um, and we're going to thank everyone for joining us live on the the first it's actually probably the first live podcast we've done and hopefully it's going to be the first until next time class dismissed Nailed it. <laughs> right <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to sign off. Thank you so much for joining us and um, keep well, stay, 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 stay sane. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully be in touch with you again soon.